something very down to earth to the virtual world. And it comes from an upbringing in the woods of British Columbia and a living in the Santa Cruz Mountains now and perhaps even the raising of pigs. Um, and these pigs serve as a gatekeeper for the Digibarn Computer Museum, which he recently opened uh, with his partner Galen in July, which houses uh, in 5,000 square feet weird old computers that represent the best of evolution from 1975 to 1990. Um, and he has written a book called Avatars, which um, I'm sure is available and is, and is really great. In it, he makes an interesting distinction, which I'd like to bring to your attention, which is the difference between a virtual world and a virtual reality, or an artificial world. And he uses virtual worlds because while the place is not real, the experience that the human has is, is definitely real. Um, he's currently president and CEO of the Digital Space Corporation, where he does many things, including a new initiative called the Inner Commons, and I'll let him tell you all about it. It's just, it's great to be back here in Maine. I used to hang out in Searsport 10 years ago, and down in uh, Belfast uh, was the eighth wonder of the world, the largest sow in the world. And she had 24 piglets, so like Maine is dear to my, my heart, this sow was just... <laughs> Inspira ins inspirational. She couldn't stand up. Well, I, um, what I'm going to do for the first uh, couple of minutes here is we have a whole gang of people in a virtual world. I'm going to actually let you guys uh, see what a virtual world uh, looks like. One particular virtual world, uh, which is called Traveler, which is I'll tell you a little bit more about later. But um, just because you're, this is artificial worlds and we haven't been running worlds here, so we're going to run one here that is very dear to our hearts. It's called Traveler, and the people that are up oh, there, she goes. Lady Jay's just woken up. Um, it is these are people. They're actually a husband and wife team in West Virginia, in Huntington, West Virginia, and yep, that's indeed true. And Traveler was a, a wonderful technology that was invented about six years ago, uh, which allows you to speak in your own voice and be in this not trying to be photorealistic mask. And these people have lived in this community for years, and there's hundreds and hundreds of worlds out there online. And uh, we acquired this uh, about two years ago from a dying.com because we thought this is just too fabulous to let it die. And um, it's also on the cover of my book. Uh, anyway, so I'm going to let these folks tell you about life in Avatar cyberspace. And they're just like me, they're talking into a microphone. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, this is what I look like talking into my microphone to you, and they're hearing my voice, and up to 16 people can be in talking at once, and it's all uh, spatialized, and uh, without further ado, uh, Brian and Lady J, uh, say hello to uh, Camden, Maine, and PopTech. Hello. Hi, welcome, PopTech. Hello, <laughs> So guys, what's it like living in Avatar cyberspace? Uh, we love it. It's our home away from home. I mean, uh, it, it is reality, albeit virtual. Um, you know, we are actually standing in the group having a conversation, but you're in Virginia, England. Uh, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's my instrument of cyberspace. So, guys, uh, show us a range of facial expressions and maybe do some calisthenics. I know. Uh, yeah, you got to get some exercise in here, right? Support. Absolutely. Y'all be around when we're having dances. Um, her avatar is a lot more uh, emotive than mine. You might want to run her through the range of uh, emotion. That's a smile. Oh, surprise. <laughs> 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 You're laughing. Ooh, the man with the canines behind you is real scary. <laughs> so, guys, what do you do when you get up in cyberspace and you need to like exercise those heads?
<laughs> Can you, you, you two are so in love and it's so touching. Can you show us uh, how you guys kiss in here? I know you're sitting right next to each other in, uh, there in your house, but when you guys kiss, and boy, it's just so nice. And when you dance. <laughs> So, so Oz, um, someone's head banging my head here. Um, what, um, why do you love travel? <laughs> <laughs> They're called head bangers, folks. It's not like I don't know. Thank you, but um, why, why don't we go out with the, the silly thing you guys don't really like to do, but let's do it anyway. Why don't we, uh, why don't we all try to do row, row, row your boat and, and uh, roll, roll, roll your heads. Okay, who starts? Who starts in? Row, row, row your boat. Okay, somebody start. <laughs> well, thank you guys for uh, hanging out this Saturday and for, I think there's somebody downstairs in the green room that's here as well uh, who's online uh, in Traveler, but uh, this is just an amazing innovation that would have died in the dot-com, horrible dot-com death, and we just kept it going, and there was good things done in the... Uh, the, the venture capital disaster we've experienced out in Silicon Valley. And um, it's now a free community service, a free uh, service online for people to experiment and, and live and, and um, make friends and, and live in cyberspace. So you guys want to, yeah, thank you so much. You want to say uh, goodbye to our audience here? Bye-bye. Don't believe it. Don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. I am teleporting out, and now we start in. So what... I'm really here to talk about today is sort of generically called cyberspace or the human face. Um, and it's, in a sense, I'm Canadian, okay? I've got an excuse. Um, I can, the, it seems to be cultural in, in the Canadian, it's sort of like being a Swede or something like that. Uh, we complain and we have poor weather, and, but our hockey teams are good. Uh, 
but we, we have a civic sense. I mean, in Canada, when you're wealthy, you don't have a great big house because that would be untoward. Um, the society, when we have our prime ministerial debates, it's about the state of, uh, of uh, child care, number one item. And they're going back and forth. And they're uncomfortable because we've never had debates, but we're trying to emulate the United States. And so, like, we shouldn't be attacking each other. It's untoward. But let's a, let child care. Now, that's something we'll get passionate about. It's got to be out in every street corner and things like that. So Canada's kind of a different place. We have a different kind of a electoral system, too. Anyway, curious. So in a sense, when I started in this medium about seven or eight years ago, I had been doing work with Xerox and Xerox Park and bringing desktop metaphors out and stuff like that. And it was, I got really tired of the Windows and Icons thing. I said in about 1990, this stuff is ancient. You know, this stuff's old. And then the web came, and I got, oh, my God documents plastering over our beloved cyberspace. We're going to be looking at documents and, and clicking on links, and it's going to kind of produce a block in between you and the people you're communicating with, because everyone's going to look at these pages all the time. And so I started a consortium, a nonprofit consortium, signed up universities. Uh, Linda Stone was a, an early supporter, got Microsoft support. We had a conference called Earth to Avatars, which John Scully uh, keynoted. And, and we brought all these people together in 1996 wrote a book on the subject, and the whole thing was that if we're going to create a cyberspace like Snow Crash, who's read Snow Crash, then who, who creates that cyberspace? Well, Bill Gates could probably create it, he has, has the funds, but in a sense, the whole thing about Snow Crash and the metaverse and the street was that the people who built the, the uh, worlds owned their own uh, space. And cool things could happen there that were designed by users. For example, uh, one incredible thing that happened in the contact consortium experiments was uh, in 1999, uh, I, we work with NASA. We do all kinds of models of future missions to Mars and stuff like that. And I knew Pete Conrad, uh, who also, and I asked Pete if he or other Apollo astronauts would come into a virtual world at the 30th anniversary of the Apollo landings and talk to students, a world built by the University of Cincinnati Fine Arts School that was a mock-up of the moon, of a beautiful museum and a lunar lander and everything. It's a beautiful homage to the Apollo program. He said, I'm, I'm not nerdy enough, but Rusty Schweikart is, and he'll come in. So I spent two weeks on the phone with Rusty on his laptop. He's navigating in a virtual world that was this world, saying, OK, how do I, how do I get into the right attitude so I can get my avatar into this command and service module? And, OK, to down the minus key, and you go down and float in. OK, I'm, you're through the hatch. It's like I had this, this data, like flash. like. Rusty, you did this for real in orbit. You're, like, you're a fighter pilot, test pilot. He said, don't worry about it. You know, old dogs can learn new tricks. So on the day that uh, we did, the, it was at the end, 30th anniversary. It was at the very moment that Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. We were all standing, about 200 of us, around this virtual lamb in our avatars. And Rusty was telling stories. And stories are the key to, to immersion, as, as we've, we've heard from other speakers. And Rusty was saying, you know, that, you know stories that... Uh, would never in the press, like the fact that when they were on the Saturn V, they were the first humans to ride the Saturn V. No one had calculated the impact force on the crew when the uh, third stage had dropped away and the second stage kicked on. So they had loosened their straps at liftoff, and they're just humming along, and third stage separations come in, and wham! And, and he said, I was thrown forward so hard, I almost smashed my faceplate on the instrument panel. And all their heart rate went up like this, and Rusty said, to, to uh, Houston said, tell the next crew keep their seat belts fi fastened. <laughs> <clears throat> so, but during this, this reenactment, fantastic things happened. Uh, but a young girl came up to, to Rusty in his avatar. She's in her avatar, first person point of view, and said, Mr. Schweikart, I think I'd like to try something. Oh, what is it, Julie? She's nine years old. I'd like to go up into the limb, and I'd like to come down a ladder like you guys did. She said, he said, well, you know, there's no collision on right now, so polygons will melt away, and you'll see yourself in this space. And you'll be in this space, you look around, and you'll see a circular thing. That's a light that was above the hatch. And then come out the hatch, and I'll guide you from there. So he's standing in his avatar, and she's up there. She's, she does it, and polygons melt away, and she's in there. She starts to come out. She, he says, stop. You're coming out for front ways. We couldn't do that. The backpack precluded us coming out the hatch that way. We came out with our rear end first. And I thought to myself, oh, interesting. I never saw that when I was a kid. I was like seven years old. Like, 
And then he said, there's a reason the camera was pointed at the ladder and not the hatch. <laughs> and she said, it would have been a moon on the moon. <laughs> Two billion people doing what you just did, you know, instead of this very serious endeavor. So she came out backwards and slid down the ladder. And, and then all the other students were there were saying, we want to try it too, we want to re-experience this too. And then Rusty said, all right, got to form a cue behind the, the limb here. And, and he started walking over. Now she's standing there sort of dumbfounded. And he's walking over to her and she's he's walking right to me. What's going to happen? And then he melted through her. And then the most profound thing occurred. She sent me a, an instant message. She said, my God, I have been touched by an Apollo astronaut. And I, I messaged her back and said, no, Julie, you know, you're just, your avatar has passed through. She said, you are wrong. I felt it in my body. I have been touched by this man. And we said, bingo, contact was made in cyberspace. And this young girl, you know, became interested in science, became interested in a lot of things. Because she felt bodily that she had had contact. She heard the story of this man. This man had helped her experience something from the past that became real to her in her body. So the anthropologists in the organization just jumped up and down. <laughs> so what else happened? Oh, let, let's take you on a little diversion to another virtual world. Does anyone know what this is? You got Mary in there, okay. This is one of the most strange things that's happening in the United States or the world. It's called Burning Man. It's the Burning Man Festival. This is 28,000 people creating a city in the Nevada desert of their own making emergent properties. Um, on a plan, there's no center stage. It's just all people creating their own. There's no spectators allowed, there's only participants. They, they do in art installations, the whole works. And what happens in this virtual world? Radical self-expression. <laughs> and logos are illegal. If you have a rider truck, People modify the logo. You cannot display a logo. You can't sell anything. You can only buy coffee at the center cafe. The whole thing is to not be in the world that we live in every day. And you want to be litigious? Well, the ticket says you risk serious injury or death by attending this event. <laughs> what else happens here? The wonderful critical tits parade. <laughs> Two or three thousand bare-breasted women in an enormous bicycle parade. That's the man that's burned on the Saturday night, and what does it mean? Whatever you want it to mean. This is a beautiful dusk scene of people on the playa. It's about a 16 square mile area, it's huge. This is the burning of the man, which is whatever it means to you, it burns the things out, or you put something in it, or whatever. But this is a 2,000 pounds of tyrotactics going on off at once before the statue starts to burn. So, burning man. Really interesting creation. As Howard Rheingold told us, made by users from the bottom up. Fascinating model. No company would have ever have done this. When, when they approached Lloyd's for insurance, the, the, Lloyd's, the Lloyd's rep came out, the underwriter, and he sort of went to Burning Man, dressed up, did everything, and had his art car and whatever, and said, you know what? There's nothing in the history of insurance that is ever we've ever written for, how about $500,000? You know, <laughs> Fewer people uh, have accidents or uh, buy, uh, die in the week here than in an ordinary town of 28,000 people. Let's jump to another virtual world. This is a virtual world in cyberspace called Alpha World, which started in the summer of 1995, user-built with a central point that ex users could go into the world and build. They could stand there as their avatars and assemble parts. Not no needed knowledge of 3D modeling. And we built a town right about here. This is an airport designed by kids on, because there, no, there was no satellite view of this. This airport was designed on graph paper. Then they stood on the ground and they laid out 50,000 parts to make an airport that would be visible from space. Going back to what Alvi said, the polygon count in here is three and a half billion polygons. But it's rendered as you walk along and stuff flows in around you. That's how a metaverse would be made. This is a bit of a retro space, but zooming into our neighborhood, this is Sherwood Forest Town, designed a, a project uh, instigated by anthropologists and ethnographers to study the construction of a town. It was done in 1996. What does it look like on the ground? This is, it's fairly crude. This is from 1996 as well. There's a wedding occurring. There's a 
the minister and two people separated by about a thousand miles. It was a phenomenal event. There were about 200 friends there. What else? Did the contact consortium decided to experiment in this meeting because that was our mission. But we decided we had a conference that John was at. Some of you were at 1996. In 1997, we had another conference. In 98, we couldn't. We, the the dot com boom was on. We couldn't afford a venue. Couldn't find a venue in San Francisco. We said, okay, move the whole thing into cyberspace. So we had a conference. We had, this is our Avi Awards ceremony, and this is the winning avatar. There's a, a webcam. <laughs> CNN FN covered this. It was incredible. As, to give you an idea of the mixture of media, we were standing there. CNN FN ran a story like, why go to Comdex and get stomach aches from hot dogs when you can come into cyberspace to go to a convention? So we had a big exhibit hall. We had uh, 50 exhibitors and everything. So they covered this, and we were standing here uh, vacuuming the carpets before the event opened, and somebody telegrammed me and said, the story is just run on CNN FN. I said, Oh, that's interesting. I hope they didn't publish the web address, and they did. And I said, look up. And there was this rain of people coming down within, <laughs> within 30 seconds. They said, the servers, it's like a hurricane. They're never going to hold it, Captain. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so there we are at the pig farm. Uh, we had big physical nodes all over the world. We had 30 locations, including universities and art museums where people could gather and jack in to the event. We do, we've done this event ever since. Last year, avatars, we took, decided to take a risk in the intellectual property front. We started to do a parody of uh, Kubrick's film, 2001 A Space Odyssey, 2001 A Cyberspace Odyssey. What did we do? Our normal stuff, we had six to 8,000 attendees in 20 hours when the world was open, the event was happening. Speakers, exhibit hall, webcam world, the whole bit, all, but all done. We did the first one, it looked like Moscone Center. This was going to be the Stations of the Cross of 2001, where you go, you live the movie, and you walk through and, and re experience the movie yourself. And everyone was saying, you know what? Don't just like, if, if somebody from Paramount.com or whatever emails, um, you know, like, just tell us. <laughs> No, no uh, cyber, no avatar attorneys appeared during this event. But everything was labeled as, everything was labeled as satirical, heroic, whatever. Uh, Arthur C. Clarke was very interested in this, though. Um, th so this is one of the stations of the cross. This is the uh, the cams world. And one of the great things you could do was like reenact Dave Bowman. So hell. Open the pod, you know, open the pod bay doors, Hal. Hal, open the pod bay doors. Hal, <laughs> open the pod bay doors. And there I am. And uh, this is Rollo, the Dutch student. He finally cranked the door open so I could get in saying, hi, Bruce. <laughs> then at the end of the event, we all went to, you know, anything about good theater is good, good climax, good, good, good theater at the end. We went to Jupiter. And we had this explosion of, of uh, this is all delivered over modems on, in a virtual world on the net, uh, all built by volunteers in about six weeks for no budget. Um, so the, the wonderful field of monoliths. So there's everyone gathering for the competition. All the judging has been done. And there's, I, re I know all these people. There's actually about seven, 800 simultaneous people, but the server only shows the closest 50. And then after the end of the competition, which was done here in the announcements we did, a dog pile. So dog pile, everyone is standing up on top of one another. And a party. So that's Stuart, the architect of the competition. This is somebody wearing one of the winning avatars. So what is in common between these two virtual worlds? Because in a sense, the, the avatars cyber conference has been called the Burning Man of Bits, or maybe Burning Man is the physical rendition of the avatars cyber conference. Well, they're, they're community built, they're full of a lot of heart, they're kind of kooky, sometimes they're incredibly professional, sometimes they're incredibly amateur, but they're made by the polity, they're a civic structure, because governance emerges and a civic nature emerges, and people come away feeling good that they've been part of something that they believed in. Now, right next to Burning Man is Reno, Nevada. When you leave Burning Man, you're totally transformed, you're like, I'm living in another world, and you hit Reno. <laughs> 
and you realize it's as fabricated a world as the one you've left, but it's designed to lighten your wallet. And after spending like an evening in these casinos, you start feeling incredibly sapped of energy. You know, bucks and energy, and it just, it just overwhelms you, drains you down. So what is, in a sense, this brings the next issues to, the very current issues of the day, what is happening to the commons? Now, there's a, the commons, you know, what is the commons? Well, it's an old term that would mean the common land you know, that was owned by a community, the green in the English town, for example. And it came to mean common property of society. Well, there's a lot of talk been recently about the, the, the disappearance of the public commons. For example, this gentleman, Lawrence Lessig, last week argued to a number of people in this building uh, about the DMCA copyright extension, arguing that the incremental extensions of, of the length of copyright from there wasn't a copyright at all to it's automatic to it was extended in 1976 and it's now been extended greatly because the Disney Corporation didn't want Mickey Mouse going into the public domain. They got a bill passed with very little debate that said, gee, you know, like, copyrights can be held by, like, for 70 years now. So it's beyond a lifetime. Now, at the same time, the Disney Corporation is bringing you wonderful things like Aladdin, which they've raided out of the public domain. And they're not allowing anything in their intellectual property pool to go back. So what world do you live in? You live in a world where your community town square is off in a shopping mall, where everything you know and love, like Gilligan's Island or things like that, which are created by media, are closely guarded and cl clutched together. So your entire cultural makeup, everything you know, from Grimm's fairy tales or whatever, has been monetized and grabbed by large interests. Companies that aren't actually very well managed sometimes. So when it comes down to it, like for example, in the dot-com disaster, most of the intellectual property that was designed, like Traveler, would have ended up in the dustbin of history. We were 20 hours from when Condisco arrived to wipe the hard drives out of the leased machines. It would have wiped all the source code out. And there's about two or 3,000 companies that are in a necropolis right now where there's patents in, in, in transition, and they're coming, they'll come due in a few years. The companies are long dead. So these guys are going in and grabbing these companies and saying, okay, what we're going to do is we don't have the source code. The technology's lost, but we're going to these patents, and we'll go sue the people who had inventions prior even to the company because of software patents. So you're losing a lot of things here. Right now, you're losing, you're potentially losing uh, your cultural commons. You're losing your intellectual property invention commons due to the litigiousness, increasing litigiousness. Now, what did Caesar do when he became Caesar? He executed a whole bunch of lawyers. <laughs> Actually, he introduced pr uh, uh, price controls. But if you look at also, something occurred to me in the summer of 2000, I, I finally got my US citizenship. And I, and I read all the stuff they give you. And it's actually a wonderful history of how the Constitution was created. It's fantastic. I learned about Ben Franklin. He created the Patent and Trademark Office such that he could give a, a three-year uh, guarantee to an inventor uh, time to have some recompense from it. But the whole purpose of patent and trademark system was to publish this stuff so it could be used by society, to create a commons and spread invention as fast as possible to as many people and their rights. And now it's upside down, as we can see. But when I became a US citizen, uh, the federal judge, we were standing there, a 1,000 of us in the hall in San Jose, and the judge was an hour late. And it's mostly Asian, very few Canadians, sort of pale Canadians, Asians, Hispanics, whatever, all beautiful people, all who've been through hell to get to the country. Because the, I also lived in Eastern Europe, and the INS is, is, is the last remaining vestige of communist Eastern Europe in the way it's run. <laughs> and it's amazing. It's like going to a bureaucratic office in Prague or, or Russia, very much. Very, very hostile, very hostile, negative people and, and an organization that is totally dysfunctional. But... So you reach that point, and the judge came in bustling and saying, I'm so sorry I'm late. I apologize to your people. I have a terrible job. I see everything that doesn't work in society. I get crushed under the weight, and I come to these swearing-in ceremonies, and I'm lifted up again. I feel better again. I feel like there's hope for the future. And we're going, what? What's going on? You know? <laughs> and then he said something very profound, which was he said, in your hand is a card that an officer, an agent has given you. This is a voter registration card. Please fill it out. Now, I have to tell you something. You may find, and it may be the case, that our national political 
uh, system, democratic system, is now closed to you as citizens. However, I plead with you, try to get involved at the local level where our democracy still functions. I thought, okay, guide to new citizens entering the United States. It's a two-tiered system with, that doesn't function as a democracy anymore. And then the elections happened, I said, he was right on. He was right on. Now, the interesting thing is recently, if you look, go back through history, Rome, at the time of, of Caesar, Julius Caesar, Rome had been a republic. Rome had the Senate that was strong. Then what happened was, you know, this very strong general, Caesar, came up. Lots of, uh, there would have been an attack on Rome, say in the Rhinelands, for example. And that became a great concern. The Roman Empire expanded by responding to attacks. So Caesar went out there, took care of it, came back, and he was the hero. Rome ended the Republican period, pretty much, and went to three centuries of, of empire. And perhaps America is ending its Republican period. Because if your representative didn't call you on this Iraq vote uh, and, and represent you when 50% of you said, oh, I don't think so, they've abrogated their duty to you. So have we... <laughs> so in, in closing, artificial worlds are great. They're great places for kids to learn. They're, they're places to train soldiers if you want to do that. Uh, we may want to question a bit of that. They're, they're wonderful places to entertain ourselves. However, the main, the commons out in the, in the world that we live in is fast uh, changing uh, for one reason or another. And it's, it's fast, but it's very slow. Copyright extension, very, very, very slow process of the loss of rights, of the loss of access to, to ability to create and innovate. And uh, you all here in this room have a power to push back in little ways. <laughs>